Let's go ahead and learn about the physiology of bones using a lot of the terminology that we learned in the prior video. We're going to be starting off with a term called ossification. Ossification means the development of bone. And the first type of ossification we're going to be looking at is called intramembranous ossification. Intramembranous ossification is where you begin within some fibrous connective tissue and you end up usually with some kind of a flat bone or something that are resembling a flat bone. The bones that would be involved in intramembranous ossification would include uh, the bones of the skull, the, the bones of the cranium, and the mandible, and the clavicle. And as you can see, we begin with osteoblasts secreting that stuff that we discussed in the last video called osteoid. Remember that osteoid is a collagen and ground substance and it is the stuff secreted by the osteoblasts. And so what eventually occurs is that the osteoblasts end up secreting so much osteoid that they end up burying themselves inside of it and creating a much uh, a more developed cell called an osteocyte. I may have made it a little bit too big in this picture. But anyway, what we see around the outside of this are still the osteoblasts um, secreting osteoid, secreting bone material. And then you see one osteocyte having buried itself inside of there while the osteoblasts around it consider, continue to secrete osteoid. Now, recall that the job of an osteocyte is to maintain the bone material surrounding it. And I've chosen to color the bone material. Um, we're gonna be coloring that orange, and you see that I started off coloring the osteoid that as well. Intramembranous ossification results in flat bone material pretty much exclusively. And so let's go ahead and draw a flat bone. Remember, just two straight lines with the figure eights in the middle there. <laughs> this time we're also going to draw some osteoblasts around the outside indicating that um, even after they have finished developing the bone, you probably will still have osteoblasts, remember living inside of the periosteum, which exists outside of the bone material. The flat bone, remember, is thin, flattened, and curved, which describes the bones of the cranium, the mandible, and the clavicle. Let's go ahead and color that um, osteoid, or the uh, bone material there. We're gonna go ahead and color that orange. A good time to remind you that bone material, bone matrix is 35% osteoid, which is uh, ground substance and collagen, and 65% calcium with these two substances living side by side with each other. I thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and draw some blood vessels as well. Uh, keep in mind that we'll have arterioles, venules, and nerve fibers living side by side, uh, but I thought I would just draw, I probably should have done the venules because it would show up better, but anyway, here's the, <laughs> here's some red blood vessels, some, some arterioles, just to remind you that this is an extremely vascular tissue entering in through the periosteum on the outside, diving into the bone through those osteons in the compact bone, and then through the trabeculae of the, uh, of the spongy bone, of the cancellous bone. I've also gone ahead and used a different color to draw some red bone marrow in there. Labeled it red marrow, couldn't see it, so I redrew it in black. <laughs> There's the red marrow. It's worth reiterating that point. Red marrow exists in cancellous bone. And there's our osteocyte being labeled, and a few more osteoblasts. We're going to go ahead and study the other type of ossification or bone development. In this, in this case, it's going to be called endochondral ossification. Endochondral ossification. So if we look up above, we've talked about intramembranous ossification, which means within a fibrous connective tissue. Endochondral means within a, a, a cartilage material. So endochondral ossification is basically the rest of the bones of the body outside of the bones of the cranium, the mandible, and the uh, clavicles, the collarbones. So Endochondral ossification is going to be typically the long bones, like for example, the femur or the humerus, things like that, but also a number of other bones in the body are developed this way. 
So the first thing we're going to go ahead and develop is something that sort of closely resembles a little peanut there, <laughs> which is eventually going to <laughs> develop into an actual bone. It's made of hyaline cartilage. And around the outside, we have periosteum, which was unfortunately the same color of blue. So I went ahead and labeled our hyaline cartilage. I wanted to draw that a little bit of a darker blue color so we could maybe differentiate between the two. Uh, we also have some orange right around that center part of the peanut. And this will be a bone, a bone collar. And around the bone collar, we also will have a little bit of periosteum. So even in the very early stages, you'll see a little bit of bone material, but most of the structure of this eventual long bone is going to be hyaline cartilage. At our next stage, we start to draw our little figure eights directly in the center of the peanut, which is now a little bit longer. <laughs> and that is going to be, it's called the primary ossification center. I don't know if you remember this, but the one with the degree symbol means primary. So the primary ossification center is going to be basically a place where the medullary cavity is eventually going to grow. We're also going to find a little bit more bone material. It's kind of going to be kind of diving into the bone at this point, and we'll go ahead and draw our periosteum as well. And at this point, you are going to start to see blood vessels entering in through the, from the periosteum, diving in and starting to vascularize that cancellous bone material inside of the, uh, of the uh, primary ossification center. You, of course, also, again, would have venules here and nerve fibers. All that stuff would be developing at the same time, but just for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to draw the arterial. At the next stage, we're going to start to see everything that we saw in the previous one. However, the bone material is going to be extending a little bit more inwardly into the bone, and you're also going to start to see cancellous bone in the epiphyses, or the what's going to eventually become the epiphyses. But at this point, they're going to be considered the secondary ossification centers. So both, both epiphyses, both ends, both bone ends are going to have um, cancellous bone at this point, secondary ossification centers. Now in the center of the bone, we're really going to see a great deal of bone material there. So we're coloring that in orange. Again, our periosteum around the outside. That's where the blood vessels come from, the arterioles, venules, and nerve fibers. And they're going to be diving at this point and vascularizing into, you know, further vascularizing the primary ossification center and now also entering into both secondary ossification centers. In the last stage, we're going to go ahead and develop what's pretty much a fairly de well-developed bone. What's going to happen is throughout childhood, the bones are going to look very much like this with pretty much the entire extent of the, the long bone being what we considered a bone, um, it's going to have osseous material there, it's going to have bone material, so lots of our osteoid, 35%, uh, and calcium, 65%. When we look back at the previous stage, what's going to happen is the epiphyses are still going to be made primarily of hyaline cartilage. So I went ahead and colored those blue. With only the center, you see the diaphysis is going to be bone material. The epiphyses are both going to be hyaline cartilage. And in the previous stage, pretty much the majority of what we see here is hyaline cartilage. So we're going to use that nice deep blue for that. Just a small amount of, of bone at that stage, you see. And then it becomes more bone materials. That once we get to the fully developed stage, there's only a few spots of cartilage left. The very ends of the bone are going to be made. That is not actually periosteum on the ends. On the outside there, that is now considered articular cartilage, which is actually uh, hyaline cartilage. We also have hyaline cartilage in those epiphyseal plates, which are also drawn here. And around the outside, you really can't differentiate it. I don't think these two blue colors. But anyway, we have the, um, the periosteum around the outside as well. All right, but other than that, other than those few spots of hyaline cartilage, the articular cartilage, and the epiphyseal plates, the rest of it actually is bone material at this point. It's basically considered a fully developed bone. You could walk on this, for example. Um, I would say at about 25 weeks gestation, babies have their bones fairly fully developed like this. And those epiphyseal plates remain as hyaline cartilage throughout growth up until about the age of 20, perhaps, maybe the age of 18, something like that. The epiphyseal plates are more commonly known as growth plates. And of course, we go ahead and 
pu punch those uh, blood vessels straight through. Arterioles representing here, the arterioles, venules, and the nerves, which are punching through and penetrating straight from the, uh, the um, periosteum, directly through the compact bone, through the osteons, and also into the epiphys epiphyses. All right, let's go ahead and label the epiphyseal plate, also called the growth plate. And also the articular cartilage, which again is one of those very last spots of hyaline cartilage that's sort of left over from the ossification process, the developmental process. Now, I want to point out that the epiphyseal plate is important for longitudinal growth, the, the lengthening of the bone while a child is growing tall. However, it's also important to point out that even after the age of 18 or 20, when a child stops growing, you're very likely to continue to have appositional growth and decay, which is oftentimes called remodeling. Bones grow in response to the demands placed on them. Also, grow, bones shrink away when they're not being used. And it, it's important to point out that osteoblasts and osteoclasts are going to be part of both of these processes. If we're lengthening the bone, then we basically add bone at, in a long way, but we also take away bone that's inappropriate so that the bone is appropriately shaped. The same thing happens during appositional growth or during, re, during remodeling is that when you are growing a bone, it's going to be using osteoblasts, secreting their osteoid. But when you're decaying a bone away, because sometimes that is appropriate, then you want to use osteoclasts, which are secreting their enzymes and acids. And so when we talk about longitudinal growth, this is happening only at those epiphyseal plates, those growth plates, and it happens only during development, up until a child is fully grown. However, that remodeling continues throughout your life depending on what you're doing. If you're working out and working your muscles quite a lot, then your bones will continue to grow because the, the muscles will actually be tugging on them and kind of forcing them to bear more density. However, if you're going through a period where you are not using muscles as much, then the bone is likely less likely to be stressed and is like um, less likely to uh, undergo appositional growth. All right, so let's go on to our next topic, which is bone repair. We're going to be using a simple fracture of a long bone that did not require, for example, a surgical intervention. However, it may have required a manipulation. If you have a displaced fracture, which is quite common, it's possible that the bone ends might not be facing each other the way that I'm drawing them here. You see those jagged ends there <laughs> kind of represents the break. It's rare that a break is so lucky that the bone ends are especially a complete fracture like the one we're seeing here. It would be very likely that the bone ends would actually be uh, displaced. And so the manipulation would mean you know, simply physically pushing them back together, which is oftentimes a painful process and might require a quick anesthetic such as propofol to do it. Uh, but anyway, so let us, let us assume to, at the start that the bones are in fact not displaced as we're seeing here and they're facing each other perfectly. The first thing that's going to happen is a great deal of blood is going to ball up around the injury site and this ball of blood is called a bolus which is actually uh, healing properties. And for the sake of continuity, I'm just going to include a little medullary cavity, a little bit of cancellous bone along the edges, and then some compact bone along the outside to indicate that this is, yes, a complete fracture right in the center of the diaphysis of a long bone. Now the next stage, what's going to happen is the first thing that's going to happen is there's going to be granulation tissue in place, which is a really fast growing tissue that would grow in place at about a day or less than a day. But the next thing that's going to happen is hyaline cartilage or some type of cartilaginous material is going to grow and you'll notice it kind of takes exactly the position that the uh, blood bolus did in the previous stage. Now this stage is going to be considered fibrocartilaginous callus formation and so again simply a, a cartilage material taking the place uh, that sort of as a gap stop in that fracture position. Again, we're gonna go ahead with the same pattern. We're going to draw our little medullary cavity there. 
and some cancellous bone around the outside of the medullary cavity as happens. But in this case, we're also going to extend the cancellous bone right into the fracture site. And so what happens here is that something resembling spongy bone grows in the same spot where you had the fibrocartilaginous callus in the previous stage. Now this stage is called the bony callus stage. And so something resembling bo uh, bone, although it's spongy bone, it's not really the right type of bone for this for this locus. Um, however, you do have bone material there. It's spongy bone, cancellous bone, but it is a start at growing actual bone, actual ossification, actual development of bone. The last stage, as you can see, we have a complete medullary cavity, all the little cancellous bone around the outside of the medullary cavity, and then we also have compact bone, which is completely replaced all of the material that had been there during the fracture repair. And so we consider this stage to be remodeling. And depending on the age of the person who fractured their bone, remodeling could be a really long stage. It could take many years to heal this way. But a young person is in the best position to heal from a fracture well because um, their remodeling could happen fairly quickly. You'll notice, however, that the bone is not perfectly straight. This is pretty typical. You'll, you might continue to have some level of misshapenness in the fracture site um, for many years. Well, our last topic in this particular lecture is going to be discussing osteoclasts and some of the damage they can actually do. Osteoclasts can be extremely beneficial when we are talking about remodeling bones. And when we talked about bone remodeling in, in several of the stages here, we're discussing the ability of um, osteoblasts and osteoclasts to properly shape bones in the way that they're supposed to be shaped. However, there are certain situations where osteoclasts can be a little bit overactive and this can be damaging to the bones. So the best way to get osteoclasts activated is to release a hormone called parathyroid hormone or PTH. It's going to be released from the parathyroid gland or parathyroid glands. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw these little circles here. These are going to be trabeculae. And so we're assuming that these little holes here are trabeculae and that the structures around them are going to be spicules. And so, and then inside of these trabeculae, remember the lining here is not going to be periosteum. Do you remember what it's called when it's lining the trabeculae? It is called endosteum. So in this picture, we're showing some spongy bone. We're showing trabeculae lined with uh, endosteum, and we're showing spicules of bone in between those trabeculae. And what we're showing here is spongy bone that it's actually healthy. This is kind of the way it should be looking when it is healthy. However, if in a situation, and there's a number of reasons this might happen, um, when the osteoclasts become a little bit too active, remember that both osteoblasts and osteoclasts are living inside of that endosteum. They are in a perfect position to be doing appropriate remodeling throughout your lifetime. However, in the situation where you are releasing a great deal of PTH, this parathyroid hormone, and it starts to activate those osteoclasts, then we will have a situation where the osteoclasts are just eating away at that bone. So what I've done is I've drawn the same spongy bone, I've done my best, <laughs> I've drawn the same spongy bone as up above, but this time I've drawn it with very large trabeculae. You notice the trabeculae are all enlarged, you still have that endosteum there. And I've also drawn some little pores, little puncture marks in the spicules themselves, indicating that the spicules have become damaged, the trabeculae are quite large. Basically, the osteoclasts are simply eating away at that bone material. And again, there's a number of reasons this might happen, but one of them might be the presence of a great deal of parathyroid hormone. And this is bone that we consider to be osteoporotic bone. So this is a person who is suffering from osteoporosis, which would be in, uh, an eating away of all the different bone types, but it's easiest to see in cancellous bone, in spongy bone. So this is an osteoporotic bone. 